So, um, Adrian Casper, do you guys first of all want to introduce yourself a bit? Tell us, tell us about, about you know yourself, yourself your, your own, own experience, experience, as well as, well as, as what your, your companies, companies do. do. So, so Casper, why, why don't you go, you go first? first? Sure, sure. Um, well, I'm Casper uh, Terhorst, one of the co-founders of Product IP. Um, I have a background in mechanical engineering and, and quality control. I worked for a testing institute in my first few years of my professional life. Then I moved to the other side of the table. I worked 10 years for a Taiwanese manufacturing with plants in China. We were mass producing consumer electronics, uh, always in the role of product compliance officer, so taking care of quality control and product compliance. Uh, had an in-between intermezzo uh, company in Asia, uh, Asia XL in Beijing, making animations for people manufacturing things and then run into my old chef, Maarten van der Dussen, uh, in 2007, <laughs> where, where we uh, founded Project IP in about uh, 50 minutes. Uh, we, um, we had an idea that uh, people in retail and trade could use some help dealing with product compliance. So it is a very complex issue if you look at it from the outside in. Um, so basically the, my life is uh, revolving around dealing with uh, making product compliance very simple. Exactly. That is super important in the sourcing industry, of course. Adrian, what about you? Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> I'm the senior quality manager of uh, GF Asia. Uh, well, in terms of background, I, I came to Asia actually back in 2007. I've been located in Hong Kong uh, since then. And I've got uh, quite a bit of experience uh, with uh, retailers and labs. So I've especially worked with... Uh, Casino Global Sourcing, the sourcing office of the, the French retailer uh, Casino. Then I moved to uh, laboratory. I worked for Bureau Veritas, BV, uh, for five years, both of, uh, on non-electrical and electrical product, taking care of French customers uh, with uh, commercial and technical support. And back in 2015, I moved to uh, GF Asia as a, with a role of quality manager and now senior quality manager. So GIF, um, I'm sure a lot of uh, people in the sourcing industry have heard this name. Uh, GIF is a key retailer in France for hard goods, uh, selling a well-priced product uh, for home. Uh, we have a very extended range. It's a family-owned business uh, running very successfully for the last 35 years. And today it's around 600 stores, uh, mostly located in France. Uh, we've also some uh, international development uh, around Europe, in Spain, and with a partner in Belgium. So here in Asia, we're taking care of the sourcing, uh, we're finding products uh, for our buyers back in Europe, uh, and making sure that everything is going well, especially on the quality and the conformity of product, uh, so that we can clear the customs, uh, bring safe product uh, for our customers. Uh, and in my role and responsibilities, there's also plenty of other aspects uh, from compliance, uh, conformity, quality, uh, we're looking also at corruption, we're doing regulatory watch. There, there's quite a few uh, activities that we are supervising. Right. Thank you so much for that introduction, Adrian. So all of you guys watching, feel free to post your questions for our panel over here in the comment section. And make sure that you click on join the conversation on the top right hand side of your screen to sign in and then post your comments. All right. So, um, so Casper, uh, let me start with you first. Um, I've heard that there is a, a new EU regulation that our buyers need to be aware of. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I think you refer to the EU regulation 2019-1020, which was uh, signed off last last year. Uh, first of all, I think everybody needs to know that in Europe you have directives and, and regulations. And regulations are in such a nature that all the member states will convert it one-to-one -one in, their, in their own legislation. So obviously, the regulation has a little bit more importance than a directive. A directive has a, a common goal and each member state can reach that goal via their own legislation. So that might result in a little bit different legislation in the different member states. But this EU regulation 2019-1020 uh, 
is an evolvement of something what we have today and what we have today is called the new legislative framework which is a framework for everybody involved in bringing consumer goods non-food consumer goods into the eu member states in the eu market it arranges roles and responsibilities for an importer a brand owner a manufacturer in the in the uh, in the european union but also uh, retailers uh, including market surveillance officers. So you, what you have in a framework, you need, to, um, you need to have roles and responsibilities for all entities. That framework, what we have now, the new legislative framework, is already there for about uh, six, seven years live. So they started probably develop it, developed that 10 years ago. And there's a need to renew it. Today's market, the roles of people in the market have changed. The routes of consumer goods to consumers has changed. So in the new legislative framework, first of all, what is very important is they arranged market surveillance authorities, responsibilities, but also the rights that they have are now the same in all member states. And this new regulations comes live summer 2021. For market surveillance authorities, it comes live January 1st, 2021. Why is it so important? Well, market space authorities having the same rights in all the member states means level playing field for everybody that deals with the different member states. It would be unfair that you have a lesser strict regime when you enter the EU market via country A than in via country B. So it should be should be the same. And the market space authorities should have the same instruments and the same rights to enter a property or seize products or seize data to find out uh, if everything is formally compliant. That's step one. Step two is, in today's world, fulfillment service providers are, uh, have a very important role in the market as well. In the old framework, they were not mentioned specifically, which means that they could probably avoid being under scrutiny of market surveillance authorities. They are not a brand owner, they are not a retailer, they are shipping goods from somebody else outside the EU maybe to a consumer. In the, in the new framework, that's gone. In the new framework, they are specifically mentioned. And if the goods that they supply to an EU consumer do not have an EU address on them, not somebody claiming to be the EU brand owner, an EU manufacturer or an importer, then they automatically become liable for product compliance. That's a massive shift. Uh, what you have seen is that based on that, the four largest ones, is Amazon, of course, eBay, Rakuten and Alibaba already signed a safety pledge with the EU Commission about two years ago, um, ensuring that they are on the table with them, discussion what they need to do first, how to cooperate when there's a recall, how to take products from their platforms very fast, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, massive shift and that I'm sure will have impact on many in the supply chain as well. And the third part is that there is also a route for products coming from outside the EU directly to consumers in the EU. And it's an EU consumer can buy something from a platform outside the EU. And the European Commission has, has said, okay, we need to monitor that flow of goods as well. It's very complex because there's obviously a large number of products and a large number of parcels flow, flowing around that route. Um, but they say the following. We want to have a, um, an online platform, an online register, where we can list product categories that are, we, that are considered high risk. Based on recalls, you can say maybe uh, LED bulbs, power banks, uh, hoover boards, various jewelry, so it's products with CE and without CE, maybe children's clothing, different things that are often uh, subjected to recalls. And those products floating from outside the EU towards EU cons consumers must have marks on the outside indicating where market surveillance authorities can contact somebody in the EU around product compliance. If not, the custom officers can take those parcels out of the route and don't need to notify anybody. They can simply destroy them because they feel these products are not compliant. Um, that is interesting because if a parcel is on the way to a consumer with a track and trace, and somebody takes it out of the supply chain, then obviously those consumers will start to call other companies, say, hey, where's my parcel? 
they put a lot of pressure via this route. They put a lot of pressure on other companies involved in bringing products on the market, saying you should also start to work on ensuring that products entering the supply chain from outside the EU, which the European Union cannot monitor because it's not their law, um, that they are already in good order and that compliance is taken care of. And if they can put a new product category overnight on that register, and Adrian probably will confirm that later as well, the adaption of an industry to a certain stricter regime for market surveillance authorities, you talk about six months to a year. So via this, you know, it's like a it's like a casino basically. If you are if you are in a supply chain and you think okay, uh, need some ion batteries and hoover ports, it's, it's, it can be okay. You don't know if the product category will be on on that list tomorrow. And if you're not prepared, then suddenly your market is gone. I think it has been a smart move. Um, of course, adoption will be always a little bit slow, but the end of the transition period is uh, summer of, uh, of next year. And good to know, even regardless of the corona, uh, it's no delay on that. In fact, the, uh, the corona crisis, and we'll come back to that later, has put more pressure on the EU Commission, uh, saying this regulation is, we need it, we need it more than ever today. Uh, that's basically it. The 2019-10-20. It's coming uh, next year. We probably see uh, an increase for companies outside Europe wanting to get an EU authorized representative. So this is like a trust office. So you set up an office or you set up a contact actually for market surveillance authorities in the EU, where market surveillance authorities can 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 have access to information. Obviously, with Project that be as a web-based digital platform for such documentation, this is a service that we already offered and are offering uh, even more for, for that common change. Right, so that's a very significant change. And of course, there's a lot of you know cross-border e-commerce that's happening from China and other countries you know, in, into the EU. So I guess that would be affected significantly as well because a lot of the companies that are maybe in Asia or other countries, maybe even, even the US, they now need to have a representative in the in the EU and they need to have you know um, like, like a, a company in the EU um, so that that definitely um, I think will bring about quite a significant you know amount of changes so um, Adrian let me ask you what how does this affect GFI and um, you know does it affect your daily operations or your sourcing your your shipments or the way you do audits and inspections and also, how are you adapting? Well, actually, the, the the impact of this new regulation for GFI is fairly limited because we do uh, we do have all these restrictions for a long time as a regular brick and mortar retailer in France. We have physical pre uh, presence, so authorities are, are already controlling us uh, quite a bit. And uh, the responsibility we have uh, with our physical presence in Europe is uh, is already there for a long time. So I, I think we have a lot of experience in all this. And uh, the, this is quite interesting for us to see the, the rest of the business and especially the, the e-commerce uh, right now coming into a pretty similar framework. I think it's a very important regulation once again. Uh, Casper is, 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 is totally right. It's going to be changing quite a bit for for all the small uh, or medium, Amazon, uh, Alibaba, uh, Rakuten, e-traders e e uh, who were flying a bit under the radar. We have to to admit. Um, I, I think this new framework is is bringing pretty much the same requirement as we do uh, to oblige every single seller to, to do proper risk assessment on their product, to understand the regulation uh, that they are under, and to make sure they have the full documentation. Because uh, we can imagine that uh, with the resources of the authority, well, th the flow is pretty massive. The pipeline of products now going through e-commerce uh, is very challenging to control for, the, for them. Uh, however, we, with this and 
this requirement to have uh, documentation available easily, contact uh, who can provide all uh, details. Of, um, this gonna push also uh, the, those freight forwarders, uh, the DHL, SF Express, and all the those companies bringing uh, goods uh, to Europe uh, to also make sure that they have the documentation. And more important, I think on top of this regulation, we're seeing uh, from Europe, from authorities, uh, new tools for control. Uh, for example, if you take all these products submitted to to uh, energy label, uh, so all the bulbs, the large uh, household appliance, uh, the, the, also some screens, some audio video IT screens, now there is a website uh, handled by Europe uh, called April, where you have to register all uh, the energy labeling and all the energy consumption information of your product if you want to place it on the market. And we have already got questions from, from authorities about it. And now it's actually very simple for customs officer, for example, just to go online, uh, key in the, the item reference, and they can check if you have registered your product uh, properly. And this is applying at the moment mostly to this kind of item, but we're seeing plenty of other type of product. And I think Casper uh, quote a, a few of them, but uh, if you talk about uh, product with substances and mixtures, uh, they, there is a registration now to do uh, also with UFI number, uh, mostly for present center, but this is also something they are checking. And what we can see is authorities and especially customs officers are getting uh, tools now to control. And we can imagine they will use the same uh, tools after as th those uh, e-commerce platforms have uh, using AI and so on to uh, manage to, to spot all these items that are probably not compliant or higher risk. Sure. So sure. I, I think we, we've as GP, yeah, the, the impact is definitely going to be limited, but uh, it, it's going to bring more fair competition for us. And uh, I, I think the yeah the impact for for traders, for e-commerce people uh, will be tremendous. They, they, they have to adapt to this. Um, on top of that, we're seeing a, a continuous flow of new regulation coming. Uh, and as, as Kappa say, it, we, we see it can go fast to, to, to launch new stuff uh, by authorities. And it's, it's quite challenging for us to adapt. Uh, you know, right now, for example, uh, a lot of people are talking about all these circular economy stuff uh, coming in with the ban of plastic and so on. Uh, it, it's giving us a big headache to understand the, the full requirement, what will be allowed, what, what won't be. Uh, authorities are also sometimes uh, a bit lost into all these new requirements. So it's, I think with, with tools like, like product IP and, and solution like that, we will need more and more <laughs> to, to understand regulation and to, to build technical file, technical documentation to, to be able to safely enter the market. Right. So, um, Casper, that leads me to, um, you know, the next question for you. So product IP, of course, is, um, it's, it's basically a market leader when it comes to collecting and reviewing and organizing product compliance, um, you know, evidence and, and uh, a lot of technical data as well. So what sort of changes do you see at your end? Yeah, just to continue also on what Adrian says, I think for most people as a, as a consumer, they feel that product compliance for non-food is not too complex uh, because you, you might refer to it as you, you put an electrical product, you put a plug into a socket, you get a big spark and smoke coming out of it. Well, that was not compliant. But today's compliance agenda is, is, is really, really complex. And many of the aspects around product compliance are not visible to the end user. Would you return a charger for a telephone back to a shop when it uses too much energy when you have plugged it in? but not plugged into your phone, so it's called standby current? No, because you wouldn't know. And what Adrian said as well, would you check the energy consumption of products? No. But these are 
regulations that are trickling down from Kyoto and Paris meetings on what we need to do to save the planet and, re and reduce energy consumption, it trickles down to an energy label. And um, uh, to, to, en to ensure that we are doing all, all play our part, you need to start to ask the right questions into the supply chain. And, and that is where, where we come in. You know, if you look at how many regulations there are in Europe, how many directives and, and regulations could be applicable to non-food consumer products, that could be 20 different regulations. So we've topped that off and we said, in product therapy, people need to start with what they do know, a product. So you type in a product or you upload a picture and, we, and they say, okay, it's a charger. But we may need to know two or three more things. Is it with USB out? Does it have a power bank functionality inside? Is it a smart chi charger that communicates with your telephone and based on that Q&A and people can answer that uh, you know they cannot come up with the questions but when we post the questions they can come up with that then they then they say yeah this is my item and then we generate a requirement list and the feedback of the supplier to that requirement list uploading the, the compliance evidence the, the speed the readiness of them because the, the more deeper you go into the supply chain the more specific the company should be they are making charges all day, so they should be able to answer questions, to be on top of things, and to demonstrate that they are truly a reliable partner when it comes for, for two, two products. And what we see is that when we started, it was a, much a tool for, let's say, for Adrian in his role as a Q&A manager, get an overview, uh, offer the best tool to his team, uh, ensure that you have asked the right questions to the supplier. but. On the management layer of managing suppliers, now it's about performance. You can have suppliers with great ideas and great products, but when they not are not organized around product compliance, you simply don't have the key that's called access to market. And with, with registers like April, which is a database on energy, or a register on, uh, on certain chemicals that it might be released. The European authorities have done something very, very smart. You can almost see like a tax system. You need to fill in the form, you need to enter data. But most of the people that are in the European market side, far away in the supply chain, they don't have that data. So you force the supply chain to become very efficient. You fill in this data, and now the market surveillance authorities, they don't need to check your formal compliance at that very moment that you sell a product. They can audit you three years later and say, okay, what kind of products do you put in the market? Da, 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 da. How did you register? Register? No, I didn't register. So they can, they can catch you backwards. They can review an administrative process. I think it's very fair because the European framework says things will go wrong simply by quantity of consumer products. There might be a mishap during ma during mass production. The question is: Is everybody involved in control? Can we identify a batch? Can we recall it? Can, do we know to which consumers or which retailers the product has flown into the market? It's quite different than, for example, an American approach. Uh, these are consumer goods. These are not parts for a nuclear power plant or a system that hangs up an engine on an airplane wing. These are consumer goods, and we need to have a framework, if you follow the framework, when something goes wrong, you're not liable, but you need to help to clean up the mess. Um, and companies need to start to act as market surveillance authorities. It's called self-certification. What we have seen is that people start to realize that, that this is a, a, a very complex administrative process. And I always say Excel is a very good to start, but it's not, it's not called a substantial tool, because otherwise the, the main feature of Excel in the market would be, this is the best product compliance tool ever. It's not, it's a spreadsheet. Yeah, and and it's, it's, it's not a professional solution, ultimo, when you start to, to run a company on a larger scale. It's very nice to start with, but, but not as a, as a proof of being in, in, being in control. What we already see now, what Adrian said, we see interest from people that are involved in transporting goods to the EU market, saying, how can Product that be help us to identify if, if, the, if the document claim that people have in the supply chain is, is, is true? Because they can have a stack of documents, but they could be comic books for, for, for 
for a shipping company. And our, our platform helps to identify, you know, these are genuine documents, are relevant for the products. They, they have a, an evidence value, um, as well as that we see that large fulfillment service providers are pushing the market to say, listen, you, you either fund a company yourself as a non-EU manufacturer, start a company in the EU, or find yourself an EU authorized representative. Otherwise, it will, um, cannot, otherwise you cannot have access to our platform selling goods. Uh, and you know the, the volume of the, of the eBay, Amazon, Rakuten, and Alibaba uh, that is involved in that. That's a massive cost, you know. Um, and it's a formal compliance. You know, you talk about, you have a warehouse of a fulfillment service provider in the EU. It might be stacked with products that are fully compliant, but if there's no EU address on there, any market surveillance authorities next year, summer can walk in and say, listen, I have no idea who is, who is the owner of this product in the EU. So it's you, dear fulfillment service provider. Uh, can you show me and demonstrate why these products sh should enter the EU market? Do you have any paperwork? So they put a tremendous potential uh, documentation workload on these companies for products that might be very compliant. But, there, but, but, but they cannot prove it. So we see already a lot of effort going into uh, into that. Um, for us, it means ensuring that we have a good onboarding process, uh, that we have uh, good tu tu good tutorials. Uh, we don't want uh, people in the supply chain to call us. We want them to be uh, able to uh, to rescue them themselves. It should be DIY, do it yourself on Project IP, uh, and, and that keeps it up. Right. And um, Casper, how do you think these marketplaces are reacting like Amazon, eBay? Do you already see them making some changes or announcements? Sure, sure. I think them working together and signing a safety pledge together with the EU Commission, that's, that's very good. You know, if you if you are on the table and you, you show that you acknowledge that something has to be done, uh, that's good. They started with around 10 different points that they want to improve or should improve on. And one of the first uh, points was when there is an EU recall of a product, the, uh, they all should cooperate and get this product and similar products off their platforms ASAP. Because it doesn't make sense that um, uh, company A is involved in recalling a product with a certain aspect that is proven to be dangerous and that companies B, C, D starts to sell it or continue to sell it. Um, or that you need to get it out of the physical stores, but then an online store, it's still there. It doesn't make sense. So on these 10 different forms, uh, 10 different points, they have uh, promised a safety pledge to uh, make gradual imp improvements and inform the EU Commission proactively every six months. They've done now two, two report forms. Uh, I don't think the EU Commission is very excited about the progress. They, 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 have, they have been making pro progress on certain points, but I think these are the relative easy points. They are more IT related in the sense, if this EAN code, a product with this barcode has been recalled, can you take it off the platforms very soon? That, that they have done, they have uh, created direct contact points like a red telephone for for market surveillance authorities. Quite easy things to do. Uh, I think the real challenge will be uh, getting the EU ARs for all their uh, all their sellers uh, up and running. Uh, it's 12 months from now. That's 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 nothing. You know, you're not talking about a thousand or ten thousand. Look at the global sources catalog. How many people? are on your global sources platform and, and, and try to imagine how many of them do not have an EU authorized representative address and still would like to sell directly to, to Europe. Now try to organize that. It's, uh, it will be a, a massive effort. I think uh, we, we all involved will not have a lot of sleep the coming uh, 12 months. Right. So, so Casper, how do you think uh, these entrepreneurs or, you know, these, these businesses should prepare uh, what is the first and, and the most important thing that they need to do now to start preparing? Well, I think they need to start to create more awareness because the farther you are outside Europe and you have no idea that this is happening, then uh, why, why you should act? Uh, I, I think that, and Adrian probably with his experience, we, we both are in been dealing with uh, suppliers, not only in China, but in different regions in the Far East for 
last 20 years. Um, I'm confident that these suppliers can do it. Uh, but they need to start to focus on certain product groups, not uh, divert from power banks to toys, from apparel to uh, shower caps. I mean, you, you need to get a focus. It's it's not easy to do things right every time, again and again and again. And this is not the same only for the production side. I think Adrian will confirm. If, if you have a certain base, he has a lot of products that he needs to deal with, but he needs to focus on the number of suppliers. And suppliers need to start to focus on where am I really good at, where I want to excel in. And if you want to skip or shift from product category A to B to C, just by any kind of demand, instant demand, uh, that will be really, really tough. You, you will have a longer lead time to market uh, if you are not prepared on the documentation side. So uh, I think everybody needs to find his, his sweet spot where, where they're really good at. Right. So, of course, importers and, uh, you know, uh, cross-border sellers or Amazon sellers need to prepare. But what about manufacturers themselves? How should they uh, they prepare and, you know, what, what steps do they need to take? I've, well, it's the fair play that Adrian said as well. They need to start to act as what Adrian needs to do. They need to be acting as if they are in the EU. Mm-hmm. They need to be able to answer questions. They need to They need to start asking questions to their own suppliers. That, that for for GV, that would be second tier, because it would be the, the supplier of the supplier. Right. Uh, they need to understand not that somebody just ships them a plastic part. It needs to be known what kind of plastic and what kind of uh, additives are being put into that plastic. Yeah, the product is painted. What paint? Do you have an MSDS of this paint? What substances are in this paint? Uh, they need to know more about everything that they use to put things together. You cannot just simply go on a market and say, oh, we run out of glue, we buy some glue and we use this glue. No, 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 no. You need to be, you need to be really on top of things and uh, you need to be meticulous, administrative-wise. Um, so it, it needs to basically become a more mature business. Manufacturers need to get organized. It's not just about making a thing very beautiful, it's about making a thing perfect and get the documentation that supports that in good order. So they, they could start using product that be themselves, not rely on, on GV asking them to provide documents via our platform. They can start building a file and, and sharing that into the supply chain, sharing that to markets or be ready to share it with market surveillance authorities as well. Right, that totally makes sense. So, Adrian, let me come to you and uh, ask you about your your own suppliers. You know, what steps are they taking, or are, how are you working with your suppliers in in terms of compliance? And um, also, how transparent is the supply chain? You know, overall, and is is it easy to to get transparency in the supply chain? Yeah, well, no, that's that's probably the biggest challenge uh, we have. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it, uh, for, for the manufacturer, and Casper gave, gave quite a, a bit of input already, but uh, one of the key things for the actor of the supply chain today is to really understand the requirement to their product. I, I think in the recent years, when we go to fairs like Global Sources, when we talk to uh, salespeople who who providing product, they, they usually tell you, oh, yes, I have the CE, I have the CE. But uh, usually it's very difficult to find someone who can really explain what's behind this CE. And it comes to the guy uh, who is in charge of compliance and conformity deep in the factory and nobody really knows him. And I, I think it's very important, and that's also what this new regulation is bringing, is uh, you cannot talk only about, oh yes, I have the CE. You need to understand what does it mean, what what is behind, what directive, what regulation is applicable to your product, what standard, what test report you need. And sometimes you even need to go all the way to, okay, this uh, laboratory who gave me that certificate uh, in China, is he approved to give me that certificate? You know, there is accreditation bodies uh, in China, in Europe, uh, CNAS, UCAS, whole class in Hong Kong and so on. Uh, they, they they validating labs for a scope, and we're seeing a lot of test reports that 
the labs are not supposed to, to perform because they are not accredited. There is nothing making sure that their tests are being performed properly uh, following the standards. So this is the kind of, of stuff manufacturers and importers have to look much more into. Mm -hmm. I think the other point very important is, uh, yeah, the transparency and understanding uh, the, the whole supply chain. There is one regulation that, that got updated on 7th of July this year, and I'm pretty sure a lot of people didn't spot it, but this is very important. Uh, it's talking about REACH. I'm, I'm sure everybody knows REACH. Uh, not much people understand what's behind. Uh, I probably got the, <laughs> the best explanation of REACH from Casper, actually. Uh, so REACH is a, a big database of uh, substances uh, registered with some restriction behind. And on 7th of July, there is four phthalates. Uh, so phthalates are plastifiers that are being added to plastic to make it soft, usually, that have been banned for all consumer goods. So mm -hmm. this is something that was very well known by toys people, for example, because this yep. had, had been in toys regulation for a long time. But now it's applicable to every single product. Mm -hmm. uh, so that means, for example, you do a, a luggage, uh, you have to make sure there is none of this phthalate, this four phthalate into your luggage. And for, so for manufacturing, this is a key change. And somehow you have to change a bit the approach uh, when considering your supply chain. You have to make sure that these restricted substances are not entering your supply chain. Uh, this is a key concept that, that's really coming live now uh, and uh, we we see uh, those suppliers who don't think about it they they will start to struggle anytime soon and we know some production uh, location um, in china outside china in whole asia where they have not done the shift yet and mm. this is going to be more and more challenging i think luggage is we can be a good example. They, yeah. they, they, there is a lot, you know, of soft plastic, uh, the seal, the zips, and so on on, on on luggage. And they, in the past, there were a lot of phthalates, a lot of these phthalates being used uh, that are dangerous for health and restricted now in Europe. So this whole thing is, is going to be a key turning point and manufacturers have to adapt. So I think it's very important. I think right. maybe maybe good maybe good to refer to on that. Uh, when it comes to chemical legislation, when there are restrictions, many people feel, well, why is this relevant that there is only 0, 0.0 something of something in my product? That doesn't hurt me. But you need to look around. How many products do you have in your office? How many products do you have in your house? And thresholds on chemicals are based on protecting you in your whole life. You are getting a little bit of chemicals into your body via your skin, via breathing them in uh, every day. And the thresholds of individual products need to be very, very low in order to protect you as a consumer. And that means that putting products on the market that do not meet this threshold actually means poisoning people. And uh, what we have seen is a trend that in cases also when there is a certain, uh, it's called a uh, persistence organic polluter, which is a SCCP, which is a short chain paraffin, that has a half time of 100,000 years. So if you have a kilo of a thousand gram of that product into the into the nature after 100,000 years, you still have 500 gram, and it goes into your in your, it goes into the whole food supply chain. It's probably in you and me. It's it's in everybody. So if you want to. Take that out. We had a, there was a recall of a shower curtain that had 0.2% of an SCCP in it. Mm -hmm. And it was not only a recall, there was an official case started against the, the management. So they start to do, they, they start to do prosecution next to product recall because it's, it's a crime. You're putting chemicals on the market. And, and I think people in retail and trade, they, they never see it. And if you, and if you look at, what is different today, what COVID has done in the last six months, is that everybody starts to become aware as a consumer that claims on the function of products are very, very relevant. Many people have tried to sell 
masks, surgical masks, and now people joining, jumping into all kinds of new products. And suddenly people say, whoa, it seems that there's a lot of things going on on product compliance. Just people saying it's a mask, but actually it is not a mask. But this is the same as what Alias says. It's a toy, but it's not really a toy. It just looks like a toy. And um, the interesting thing is, with masks, suddenly it was very, actually very close to you, close on your face. Yeah. You feel it should protect me. Does it really protect me? And suddenly everybody stepped out of it. Everybody started to get away. Oh, so claims on product from businesses to consumers are really important. So if I, if, if what we see as product that we, what has COVID done in between this whole regulation is that it, it uh, was putting a lot of pressure on what is called trust trust in the supply chain and we all need to start to work together and global sources need to need to uh, uh, take that into account as well and doing a good job uh, today trust need to be reinstalled in the market when people say where previous nobody started to ask questions we see that companies suddenly start to ask the supply chain partners prove it why you say it's waterproof why you say it's uvc light sterilizing products why have you any evidence how do you manage that during mass production? Have you any evidence? And this transparency, what you what you what you say, becomes also relevant because you, you want to generate trust in the market. So you need to open the books a little bit. And in in in, in product therapy, we call that reduction. We have a reduction tool so you can uh, protect certain information in your files. So the next one in the supply chain cannot see it, but we add a watermark to it. So people in the supply chain. Uh, can share documentation via product IP to generate trust. And we say you don't need to share every time. You just say you have you use product IP, so that means when shit hits the fan, the evidence is there. And I can prove it to you. Look, this is a file. I can share it to you now. Uh, and we see companies that we know for many, many years starting to ask questions in the supply chain and putting a lot of pressure on getting things right first time, where they previously feel Okay, it's not so relevant, price is relevant, price is very relevant, lead time is very relevant. Yeah. I think we have been all confronted with how relevant the true functionality of non-food consumer goods, like a mask, like a hand gel, like a UVC disinfector, is really, it really needs to do what everybody says it, it should do. And, and that, is a, that has been a big change in, in, in between uh, for the last three, four months. Right. So, Casper, you, of course, work with a lot of importers and brands. So do you want to share some tips on, uh, you know, how to make the supply chain more transparent? I mean, how as as companies, as brands, as importers, uh, especially the smaller, you know, entrepreneurial kind of eBay sellers, Amazon sellers, what can they do to get more transparency in their supply chains? How should they work with their suppliers? Well, Start to integrate product compliance from from day one for sure, and not and not at the end of when everything is ready. Um, it doesn't matter if you are a one man band or a hundred man band. Uh, yeah. Take your take your act very seriously. Uh, put put things in the contract with with suppliers. Um, ensure that you have the right for to do an inspection and an audit. Uh, could be a document inspection, could be a product inspection, and that you tie shipment of goods and payment of goods together with uh, with the documentation. Many people say, uh, but my supplier won't accept that. A good supplier has no problem to, uh, to 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 provide you with the evidence. Why would a why would a supplier say? Um, I cannot do that because blah, 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 blah. Uh, this is too complex. What the hell? What well, can be too complex? You just told me you are the best, the, you are the best power adapter manufacturer of the whole world, and now you suddenly, it's too complex. Adrian said it before. We're talking with the salespeople. The salespeople need to start to think about their two or three slides on product compliance. And I think, uh, Andy and I need to get a commission on the uh, salary increases <laughs> of all the QA uh, QC guys, everybody in China, because they're all tucked away, far away in the factory, but their role in the supply chain will become more and more, uh, in, in more and more important. I think we all need to be very honest. To bring a product to the market that is compliant, great, it's cheap and cheerful, is a hell of a job. 
and uh, I, I, I know this from uh, Mr. Wallström, who was uh, uh, responsible for uh, re worldwide recall communication from IKEA. I never joined the seminar that Project we organized. And he said, uh, would you trust a person who says, never, who says nothing will go wrong? <laughs> or would you trust a person who says, it's a hell of a job. We do everything to keep things in control. And when shit hits the fan, we step in and we can manage it. I think that last one, I'm looking for that last one. I'm looking for honesty. Uh, and uh, uh, if you, if, I, if I would be an importer trying to sell to, to GFI, I I would need to consider when I make a PowerPoint about my company, do I have two or three slides on how I deal product compliance? How do I ensure that I mitigate risk for my end customer? If I'm a factory in China, I need to ensure that I make clear to the customer, how do I mitigate risk for my customer? If you want us or anybody else to sign you up as an EU AR, we will require you to have a recall insurance. Do, do factories in China have a recall insurance? I don't think so. Nobody asked it before. Probably not. <laughs> Does it take time to set up a recall insurance? Oh, oh yeah, take a hell of a time. Do, does an insurance company want you to have to be organized? Oh yes, this is a this is a different kind of this is a different kind of audit. So I don't think you need to say it will all be okay, because all it will be, all be okay is not a key to the market. I rather have companies saying, oh my God, this is going to be so difficult. Where do you want me to start? Which product group is the most important to you? Which aspects would you like me to make the most progress on in the next three months, six months, 12 months? These are, these are good time frames. You know? if, if we would be in the Christmas tree business, we would have a chance every year to improve. Not every three months, because it's not every three months Christmas. If we would be in apparel, we would have four to six weeks running orders, running orders. We can make small changes, small changes. Uh, Adrian, you, you, you back me up on this. If you are in summer products, you can improve every summer. So if you miss the opportunity to motivate your manufacturer or motivate your supply chain partners, it could be, you know, could be downstream and upstream to, to make an improvement. It must be, it must, it must always be related to business. You can only make a change when there's money flowing. So you say, this is the order. This is what documentation you have. This and this is missing. I see this is missing structurally, like what Adrian says. I'm missing compliance evidence on on the reach on the chemical sides. You have no evidence that there are no ephthalates in it. You don't need to test everything. Find out downstream how are they making your plastics. If it's not in there, I don't need to test it. If it's there, we're saving costs. I think we we are. We are having a lot of unnecessary cost in product compliance this moment because everybody is testing something that should be there by evidence of somebody that is in control. It's actually it actually saves cost. You know, just being an amateur increases increases the cost because then you need to mitigate risk on every order by testing. You don't want to mitigate risk on every order by testing. You want to make make sure that this supplier, you know. If I dream about a supplier, I don't wake up scary and sweating all, uh, uh, screaming, waking up my wife. What's wrong? Ah, oh, the supplier give me nightmare. If you have suppliers that give you a nightmare, call them now and say, I wish you a good life. I'm going to find another one. Why do you want to deal with suppliers that wake you up in the middle of the night? Tough decisions to make, but these decisions will mean that you can focus on certain things. And then you can start making progress. Market surveillance authorities in Europe are looking for companies that are in control. They, they, they know when, that, when they audit you, things will not be up to standard 100% across the whole board. It's impossible. There's always a delay in the supply chain. But if you are caught by surprise, that's not good. But if you are on top of things, and actually you, you, you can say to the market surveillance authorities, what you have found today, we already know. We're dealing with it, we're dealing it with this way, we say bye-bye to this supplier, we are teaching that supplier, we're teaching them. You can be a teacher role to a supplier to enhance the relationship. Because in the supply chain, nobody can do this alone. You need to, you need to do it in a partnership. And you need to be honest about it. And for some suppliers, uh, it means uh, take down a little bit your pride shield 
to say, okay, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I need some of your expertise uh, to help me on this. Uh, this will increase the mutual business. Yeah, that, that, that is what, what generally we, would, be, would be my approach. Um, so the small sellers that are in Europe looking for Chinese suppliers, they have a big advantage. They can probably uh, explain things a little bit better to, uh, to the Chinese manufacturers. Uh, the Chinese manufacturers have the opportunity that they can go downstream, that they can go talk with suppliers in their own language, in their own time zone. I think this is, uh, these are good partnerships for, for the future. But focus on certain product groups would be really my tip. Right. I think that's uh, great advice, Casper. So in terms of product categories, um, you know, which categories do you think suppliers should focus on more? So you mentioned shower curtains previously. Now, that's a product that I would not have thought, you know, would have such compliance issues because typically yeah. you think of products like toys or maybe topical products or masks where, you know, the compliance and all is really important. But you mentioned shower curtains. I was like, what, really? Yeah, so in exactly. terms of product categories, it looks like it doesn't really matter what product you're selling. There are, you know, regulations and requirements for for all products, basically, right? That's true. That's true. I would say if you want, if you feel that it's that there are low risk and high risk products, and you want to create two systems in your company, if somebody proposes that in a meeting where I would be the manager, I would pay him to stay home because a person a person coming with that advice is yeah. offering bad advice. You know, there, there are no low-risk products and high-risk products when it comes to business. If, if the three of us start tomorrow the shower curtain company, then that becomes the risk. And if it's the black shower curtain company, they all need to be black. It's a business, it's a business risk in general. And of course, you can, you can have different kind of risk. If you have high-volume products, and uh, Adrian said about uh, luggage, you know, if 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 Eddie and I start to start a business tomorrow and starting selling suit, suitcases in Europe, <laughs> we ship yeah. them we ship them as half shells and they are stacked. So we're not shipping air in a container and we assemble them in Europe. Suddenly we have volume. If you have a recall on suitcases, you have a, you have trouble because you need to recall air. And exactly. So you need to consider you need to consider in your business model uh, if if you are selling products that become volume if you are selling products that are attached to a wall like a a bracket where you mount a TV on the bracket might not be a lot of value so okay we only have to recall 100 brackets and they only cost 50 euros why actually do we, do we need to recall brackets well the television sets that were attached on it fall down okay and how expensive were these television sets uh, up to a thousand euro each. Okay. So this is the liability of the company is is um, you, you 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 cannot waste time on low and high risk products. Uh, Alien, you, you have a lot of suppliers. I think what you yeah. always do is you look at the performance of suppliers, and you we we call it the maturity model. You want to see speed in growth of them, and that speed in growth need to be matching your business goals. And sure, there are suppliers that are very reliable and make high risk products and don't need any attention. Yeah. There are suppliers that are very reliable and make low risk products, but they start now with these new products and we all need to put a little bit attention on them. It's not because we don't trust them, but we together we want things to go right. Yeah? And if you look at uh, COVID, uh, more probably Adrian can, can continue on that. Yeah. Um, what we see is that many businesses start to move into new products, new products for them, often connected with new suppliers for them, and often these products are new for those suppliers as well. Yeah. Now, now you have a, this is like a, there's a new restaurant and it has a new chef and a new menu, and this chef, <laughs> this chef was not a chef before, okay? <laughs> so let's go eat sushi there, no better not. Um, so how do you, get back to trust on that uh, this is a challenge we discussed earlier last week how can you go back to that when you cannot visit the factory physically in yeah. the COVID period or you cannot do an audit well from product IP point of view we say uh, tr let's try to see if they can answer questions hello chef can you show me your last uh, sushi sushi <laughs> passing exam and, uh, are you, and do you have a health certificate and the cleaning report of your kitchen these are very basic things that a factory should have or a restaurant should have. And if these are not there, 
instantly. It's, it's, it's the old Japanese saying, you know, if you cannot manage a toilet, <laughs> how can you manage the, how can I manage the rest of the factory? <laughs> it's, it's really back to detail, back to, back to the details. Are you on top of things? And that is, that is, really, uh, that is really key uh, at this moment. Prove that you are uh, on, on, top of, on top of things. I, I don't admire Adrian his job these days. I'm running, I'm running it together with a great team. Uh, we are running a web-based service. Okay, we can work from home and we can we can see Adrian struggle in our platform and uh, pat him on the back when he uh, does a good, good does a good job <laughs> or not. But but he has to do with physical things, right. and 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 uh, he has the challenge of the commerce in France saying, guys, we need the goods, we need to turn over, the demand is there. Um, uh, but but all these products need to be not only on time and look great, but they need to do what they need to do. Uh, so I, I think the next question is is for uh, is is for Adrian. Yeah. Yeah, how do you do that? <laughs> yeah, Adrian, go ahead and. Uh... Yeah, no, I think uh, a lot of things said, but the 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 trust is a key. Uh, we we seeing uh, COVID as. <laughs> has changed a lot of things. Uh, we are all stuck, can't really travel. So I, I think one really important uh, point is to find really on site, uh, close from the factories. Uh, back a few months ago, when uh, when COVID was bad in, in, in China, we we had challenge to find uh, service providers or people who could go visit the factory. So it has changed a lot also the relationship with for sure uh, everything we've talked a lot about it but everything is in trust uh, trust is even more important than before uh, you know a lot of manufacturers are also struggling we've seen a lot of of retailers or of key players canceling goods uh, we've seen uh, goods that were very popular before that now nobody wants and plenty of new stuff like like those medical devices that that everybody wants <laughs> So uh, it has. Uh, it's it, what is really impressive is the uh, the time frame where everything has changed. You know, yeah, um, it's unbelievable. We 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 seeing yeah we see e-commerce and I think stock exchange is telling it very well that the e-commerce is a uh, has stepped a lot forward now uh, compared to the very traditional brick and mortar stuff. But e-commerce needs those physical factories, those the people like us to. Uh, to bring products to make sure they are compliant, to make sure uh, there is a well understanding. So um, the, the the whole thing has ha, ha been changing. And in the way we uh, control factories, we audit factories, yeah, we had to rethink the whole system. Once again, I have part of my team uh, located in Hong Kong today. They can't go to ma to to manufacturing sites in in in, in Asia. Uh, we we trying to develop uh, Southeast Asia, India. Uh, Vietnam and so on, we, we can't really go there because we can't fly from Hong Kong uh, over there. Uh, and so we have to invent new way. Uh, even our buyers were coming several times a year. They were joining global sources uh, every uh, twice a year. At least uh, right now they do it online. Uh, they, they select product from our office online also uh, with uh, tools like, like we are using right now. Uh, and this is the same for controlling the quality, making sure the, the compliance, and that's why also we need we need uh, good tools uh, like Product IP or others that are on the market, because uh, we we were using uh, before those Excel stuff and going with our pocket cameras and taking <laughs> pictures on site. Uh, it's not possible anymore, and if we don't adapt to change, change has been very fast. It's, it's not going to work. Right. But the professionals need so, the best tools. Yeah, exactly. So we have about four minutes to go before we need to wrap up. So my last question to both of you is, what are some of your expectations for the next six months and the rest of the year? Casper, do you want to go first? I don't, I don't think a lot of things will change in the, in the coming six months. Uh, I think we'll be stick to this rhythm. Um, it's not bad. Google yesterday announced that they uh, will stay in Soho, small home offices, uh, for the next 12 months. Uh, I think it's good for companies to offer to their to their employees and to the supply chain partners some 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 horizon. Otherwise, people become insecure. Uh, for me personally, 
embrace it as it is, you know, stay, stay connected, de de deal with it, um, and don't, uh, don't become depressed. What Adrian says, if the people don't go to the holiday, they stay the holiday at home, they buy different goods. They're still there, there's still market, there's still demand, there's still people spending, spending products, but stay in a, in a mode that is agile, would probably be the word. Stay positive, stay connected, Talk with people. Use online online tools and um, um, and continue to move forward. But I don't see things massively change in the next six months. Right. Thanks for that, Adrian. What about you? Yeah, no, I think I'm pretty much the same. Uh, we, we we for sure now we see that the the situation, the trouble time, uh, as we we have seen the recent weeks. Are gonna last. Uh, the back to school time uh, in September is not gonna be any the same as the previous years. So most important, yeah, is being agile, uh, making sure uh, we're adapting. Uh, you know, a lot of things have changed. Daily routine, the way we organize our daily jobs, the way we assign tasks to our teams, to our partners, to our service providers. Have changed and it requires a lot of uh, self-organization, a lot of uh, structure. Communication is a is a key challenge. You know, uh, talking with my fellow managers of GFI, uh now we have to to push it. We have to trigger a call. We have to to trigger uh, a, a meeting uh, uh, on one of the the video tools. Uh, which was not the case before. Before we could just grab a coffee and have a chit chat yeah. <laughs> on uh, on this this point on the process that was not working fine. So all this, yeah, we have to 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 enter it in our daily life, and this is gonna last. So this is what we're seeing definitely is coming six months and even further. Uh, situation is not th there's no new normal I think I've seen it a lot on uh, <laughs> articles and so on and so on so uh, most important is to adapt to be positive yes it's tough for plenty of reasons uh, we don't see family more easy, that easily and so on but we have to adapt we have to get the best of it and it's gonna work <laughs> right yeah positive what? positive people win Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. All right. But Casper, Adrian, thank you so much for your time today. It was a really good conversation. I'm sure our buyers got a lot, lot out of it. So thank you very much for your time today. And all of you buyers watching, stick around for the next Supplier Stories video. This is a company called Win 2000 Telecom Company Limited.